Not long ago, three astronauts returned to Earth. You probably saw where Scott Kelly, two Russian astronauts, Mikhail Kornieko and Sergei Volkov, returned to Earth and landed in Kazakhstan. Amazingly, Scott Kelly was in space for 340 days. While there, scientists with NASA, along with the other astronauts, were conducting experiments. They found that while Scott Kelly was in space, he grew taller. If you want to be taller, and I always wanted to be just a little bit taller, because I love basketball, move to space. They found also that he had a bit of a problem because when you're in space for a long time, the blood tends to push up, which means it kind of moves toward your brain and stays there. They also found that he lost muscle mass, so much so that when he got back, he couldn't walk. Someone had to carry him. You can imagine 340 days in space, scientific experiments, Three spacewalks with Scott Kelly. He even played liquid ping pong. I'm not sure how you play liquid ping pong in space. If it's like ping pong in slow motion. But the Soyuz space capsule, also known as Expedition 46 or transport in English, undocked from the International Space Station and those Three astronauts hurled some 17,000 roughly miles per hour through space. They slowed down at some point to 6,000 miles per hour. And they dropped through the atmosphere. If you know anything about it, they say it's the white knuckle experience of leaving the upper atmosphere and coming back to what we know as the Earth's atmosphere. There has to be a right tilt on the space capsule with a heat shield. If it's not done properly, they could burn up. They call it the white knuckle descent. And as they came through the atmosphere to earth, there was a parachute. And then about halfway down, another larger parachute. And then right before they get to earth, there's a blast of some kind of rocket that slows them down and the last bounce on earth. As they're looking through the glass windows, these three astronauts, there's only one thing left to do, and that's to open the door. They have to open the door from the inside, and someone had to pull the door, the latch, or the hatch from the outside, and then one by one, the astronauts came out and People had to carry them. And then later, they learned to walk again. Jesus said, I am the door. We know with the door, like the astronauts, they had to get in the door. They had to come out the door. We know that with the door, you go in and out. And with Jesus, when Jesus says, I am the door... We know that Jesus leads us, we sang about it, you sang so beautifully today, Jesus leads us in and out. And today I want to talk to you about Jesus as the door, and then Jesus goes on to say, as the door, I am the good shepherd. So look, if you will, with me to John chapter 10, beginning here at verse 1. John 10 verse 1, where Jesus is discussing with the Pharisees. If I give you a little bit of background, two things had happened. A man who was blind could now see because Jesus healed him. The Pharisees were seemingly, and we wonder why, weren't happy about this event. Then we see that Jesus cast a demon out of a man and we see that this man now declares that he sees in a different kind of way. He has new life. And the Pharisees are questioning Jesus. Quite frankly, the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus. And Jesus gives a response in verse 10 where he says, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter in by the sheep pen who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, 
but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. But the man who enters by the gate or the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman or the porter or the gatekeeper opens the gate for him or the door for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. I want you to hear the tenderness of the passage. Almost the harshness of Jesus saying, I am the door. He enters by the gate to the tenderness of Jesus saying, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate or I am the door for the sheep. And whoever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now we see that Jesus has told us two things about himself. He begins by saying, I am the door. And he ends by saying, I am the good shepherd. And really today, that's what I want to talk to you about. But let's begin with a door. We think about Jesus who says, I am the door. Why do we need a door? We need a door to enter. This week you'll go home or maybe today you'll go to your flat and you will walk to the door. You'll unlatch it or take a key and unlock the door and you'll go in. This week you'll go to work and when you get to work you'll enter a door. This week you'll go maybe to Festival Walk or maybe a mall or maybe you'll go to Uh, taste or maybe to welcome to buy groceries and you'll enter a door. Maybe this week you'll go to 7-Eleven because there's one on every corner in Hong Kong and you will go in and maybe you want to buy a candy bar and you'll enter the door. We enter doors all the time. The doors reflect where we go and what we do and how we live our lives. And here the door, when Jesus says, I am the door in verse 9, What he's indicating is, I'm access to God. I'm the entrance into God through Christ by the Holy Spirit. And so what we have in Jesus when he says, I am the door, Jesus is the way to enter in to know God. You want to know God today? Know Jesus. He is the door. If you fly into Manhattan and New York and the United States... One of the things that will happen is there will be a slight descent and a curve as you head into one of the airports. If you can look out the window, you will notice there in the harbor, there is what they call Lady Liberty, the Statue of Liberty. She's holding a torch as she was presented by the, to the United States by the French back, I believe, in the 1800s. Lady Liberty was clean not long ago. The copper was clean and it was a long process, but... Lady Liberty sits on an island called Ellis Island. They say that 40% of the people who came to America in the 18 and 1900s, 40% of the people came through Ellis Island. They came through Ellis Island and they docked their boat. They got off the boat and they went through a series of rooms. In those series of rooms, for, for example, there was one room where there was a doctor. The doctor would test their temperature, would send them through a battery of tests, ears, eyes. Unfortunately, for some people, if they were sick, they were forced to go back on the boat. But for most, they went from one room to another room where they received their immigration pass. And then they were thrust through the last door where they entered into the United States of America. And the door became a door of opportunity. But the door, Lady Liberty, the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, was the door of entrance into the United States. 
I was thinking about this this week when I came to Hong Kong and literally came to Asia for the first time back in January. Here I was and I got off the airplane and you know how it goes. You think you're rested because I slept eight hours on the 14-hour flight from San Francisco. But when I got off the plane, I was so, so tired. And I had jet lag. And so what happens is you go through one door, the door of the plane. You walk down this long hallway and you go through another door and they ask you to show your passport and thankfully mine had some special instruction on it and I handed them the passport with my sleepy eyes and they stamped it and they sent me through another door. I went through that door where it was a wide open door and I finally found my luggage. I found my luggage and then I had to go through another door to declare or not declare customs. And so I went through that door and then I went through the last door, kind of dragging along with six suitcases along the way. And Judy and there were friends from KIBC. And I can tell you honestly this morning what a wonderful feeling to see those people, but I don't remember anything about it. All I remember was getting through the doors. And the door gave me access to Hong Kong. And I remember the first time I walked through the door here at KIBC. How excited I was to come to the church. How excited on that first Sunday I walked through the door. It's given me access to KIBC and to this great church. When we think of Jesus who says, I am the door, what he speaks of is he's the entrance into God. He's the entrance into the way of knowing God in Christ. Today, the way to God is through the door, Jesus Christ. What we discover is that when we walk through the door, Jesus who said, I am the door, when Jesus becomes the door for us to know God, we know God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. We join together with the people of God. We serve Christ. We live for Christ. We pray to God. We talk to God. We listen to God. Because the sheep know His voice. And so, why do we need a door? It's entrance into God. But we also need a door because when Jesus said, I am the door, He means I am the way to salvation. John records the images of Jesus so wonderfully. John records that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John records that Jesus said, Jesus is like a road. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John records this beautiful image here. I am the door, and then later I am the good shepherd. And in these beautiful images, he's reminding us that in Jesus Christ, there's salvation. Salvation means that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Salvation means that Jesus Christ forgives your sins through the blood of Christ. Salvation means that you invite Christ into your heart. In a sense, you walk through the door of Jesus and you become one of Jesus' sheep. Salvation means that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The whole idea of salvation is very real. The word means that we make room. What you do in your heart is you make room for God, for Christ to come in, and Christ comes in. The Palestinian writer Hegesippus in the 2nd century, he was writing about James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was martyred. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was asked, What is the door of Jesus? And James, the half-brother of Jesus, simply said, The door of Jesus is the Savior. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who doubted Jesus at one point, but later came to know Jesus as his personal Savior, said that the Savior is the door. And what was true almost 2,000 years ago is true today. Jesus is the door to salvation. But this comes with a kind of warning. You see it there in verse 1. Because here Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and He speaks to me and He speaks to you this morning. Truly, truly, I say to you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. We know that the shepherd took care of the sheep. But we know that the, the sheep stayed in a pen that was walled in. 
at night especially, that sometimes there would be thieves. They would come and steal the sheep or try to steal the sheep. And sometimes there would be robbers who would come and assault the sheep. Maybe a wolf that would climb the wall and attack the sheep. And the image here is very powerful. It is Jesus' way of saying that there is only one way to Jesus Christ, one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And so he gives a kind of warning. When I went to Tao a week ago on Saturday, we walked through the fishing village. At one point, there was a boat that took some tourists out. At another point, you could see the fishing boats and There was one guy, one man, he was a real fisherman. He was fishing with a fishing pole and and he did a wonderful job. I watched him. He he was a real fisherman. But as we walked around, we were looking, uh, walking through the village and some were eating and the cuttlefish uh, had just been placed in boiling water and the guy pulled it out and I was looking at it and he said to me, do you want to hold this? And I said, sure. So I held it, took a picture And then someone later, do you want to eat this? And I said, no. (laughs) But as I looked in, I noticed that there were fish. I'm told you can say, I'll take that one. And then they'll take it in and cook it and you can eat it. And so I was walking along and there was eel. Is eel a fish? Grouper. Crab. And you know how it's like. We walked all the way around and on the point of Tai O, there used to be a police station. There was a man there who gave us a tour. It was very interesting. By the way, you can go to Tai O now and what used to be the police station is now a hotel. And for about 2,000 Hong Kong dollars, you can spend the night. The tour guide did such a great job of telling us about what used to be the police station. At one point he said, if you'll notice behind me there are some shutters, they are metal shutters, there's a bullet and there were bullet marks and he said, he told this fascinating story about a shooting on the inside and how the bullets hit the steel and didn't go through and then he took us all the way around and he pointed to a flagpole and we stood by the flagpole and I can almost imagine at one time on the flagpole was the British flag and the Hong Kong flag, if there is such a thing. But he he gave us some interesting stories about the flagpole. He said back in the day before technology and cell phones and the weather channel, he said that the flagpole was also used to give a warning. He said for the local people in the village, a flag would be raised during typhoon season. If a typhoon was on its way, there would be a flag raised. And best I understood it, there would be a number on the flag. Three would mean you're probably going to be okay. But if the flag was raised, or maybe a red flag, a warning flag, and number eight was on it, that would mean run for your life. Or maybe batten down the hatches. Because some people, he said, like to stay in the village even in a difficult typhoon. But the flag was a warning flag. Jesus here gives a warning. He says, if you try to enter into the sheepfold by some other door, if you try to climb into the, in, over the wall some other way, but don't enter into the door, Jesus, that person is a thief and a robber, but the one who enters the door by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And so what happens when you enter this door? First thing that happens is there's a personal relationship. I want you to hear the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd, the shepherd and the sheep. The language here is so picturesque that the gatekeeper opens the door and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Church, you know one of the problems in the 21st century, I see it in the States, I see it in Hong Kong, Everywhere people go, what are they looking at? Their phones. When I think of your life and my life, and I think of life in the world and maybe life in Hong Kong, we think of the busyness, don't we? We think of the pressure. We think of the doors we go in, the doors we go out. 
Some of you are kind of like me getting off the airplane. Some days we go through our days, we wake up tired, we're like zombies. And some days we go through the motions of our lives. And some days there's so much to do. We've got to get the kids to music practice, to school. We've got all these things to do. But in the midst of it, we often fail to hear the shepherd's voice. He's calling you by name. He's saying, I want your attention. He's raising the red flag. He's saying, I want you to listen to me. But I wonder if sometimes we don't focus on our personal relationship day to day with Christ. Several years ago, a man by the name of Terry Waite was a news reporter who was held hostage in Beirut, Lebanon. Along with two other men, When Terry Waite was taken as a hostage, he described the hostage situation. They would dress him, blindfold him, tie him up, and move him from place to place. They would almost starve him, and sometimes they would take off this thing over his eyes, and they would throw him rice balls, and there would be a scramble for food. He was starving. He wasn't sure, and what happens sometimes is... When this begins to, this this zombie feeling begins to set in, you're disoriented, you can't always think clearly. But one of the men had a Bible, they began to tear out pages, they began to read it, then they would tear out pages and pass them around. And Terry Waite said that when he became a hostage, he was really not for God or for Jesus or for the Holy Spirit or for any kind of church. But the longer he became hostage and the more he read God's word, the hungrier he became. And in his own words, he returned to the faith of his childhood. He renewed his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, he began to work day by day on his personal relationship. The shepherd and the sheep. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Another thing, not only this personal bond or relationship with Christ, but peace. I like what A.W. Tozer says when he speaks of peace. He says, true peace comes not by a retreat from the world, but by the overpowering presence of Christ in your heart. Christ in you is the answer to your cry for peace. This morning in the earlier service, we baptized Aaron Walker. And Aaron, is in his testimony... I wish you could have heard it. It it was wonderful in his testimony that he read this morning in the baptistry waters. He said that he tried a lot, and I'm using his words, he had tried a lot of religion. He said in this, these religious organizations that he would join, he would try the things that they would offer. And in trying the things that they would offer in their religious practice, he always walked away empty, heartbroken. But he started studying what it meant to know Christ. He said in knowing Christ, he began to read the Bible. He tried out some churches. He really had no one guiding him. And I would say the miraculous Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, was speaking to him as he started reading the Bible. And he realized he needed to come to Christ. And he said in humility, he gave his life to Christ. And then one day he came to KIBC. And then one day he called me, and I sat down and listened to him as he shared his testimony. And then he wrote his testimony out, and I got to read it. And today he read it to the church. It was a wonderful picture, because he shared at the end of his testimony that for the first time, he had God's peace. This is what Jesus provides. We read it earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. The Bible tells us that God is our peace in our going out and our coming in. One thing that happens when you enter this door, a personal bond, a relationship with Christ. Another thing is that we have peace with God. Another thing, Jesus said, I am the door. We have protection. We know in reading the 23rd Psalm that it was the shepherd's job to protect the sheep, to lead them to water to give them food, green grass, to lead them to still waters. The shepherd would often carry a staff, and on one end it would be straight. He wouldn't beat the sheep. God doesn't beat the sheep. He guide them along. 
And then with a curve, when the sheep were in danger, he could pull them up, he could rescue them. This is an image of God at work in our lives to bring protection. In that protection, I think we have to again hear the voice of the shepherd. We have to follow his instruction. I think as sheep who follow Jesus Christ, we learn to talk to the shepherd. We learn to pray. Prayer, C.S. Lewis says, is combat sometimes. P.T. Forsyth says that prayer has its great end. It lifts us to be more conscious of the gift of Christ. I wonder today if your relationship with Christ takes you to a place where you acknowledge that God is your protector, He is your peace. That day by day you work on your relationship with Christ by calling out to God through prayer and knowing that God is a refuge and a strength and a very present help in time of trouble. What happens when you enter the door is a personal relationship, God's peace and God's protection. But what kind of life do those who enter the door possess? Two things, very simple. One, abundant life. Look at verse 10. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The word life, we've looked at this before. There are two Greek words. One is bios, biology. That's when my toe hurts in the morning, my back hurts in the morning, I have a headache, the kids are loud, and I, I have to say, I've got to go take a nap. Bios is when you go to the eye doctor and they tell you to look through this little thing with, with the holes in it and, and you read the wall and you can tell them what the letters are. Bios is when you go to the doctor and they draw blood and you don't like the feeling of the needle when they draw blood. Bios is when um, you go to the knee doctor because you need knee surgery and they tell you everything they're going to do for the surgery and you kind of go, ugh. But Zoe, that's the life of Christ in the heart and soul of a man or woman. That's when Christ, you enter, Christ enters the door of your heart, so to speak. And what happens is there's abundant life, the superabundance overflowing of Christ in your life. And because of that, your life is guided, second thing, by the good shepherd. And so this is what Jesus says. Not only does Jesus say, I'm the good shepherd, but he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Here's the good news today, that Jesus Christ is a good shepherd, that he is a good shepherd who wants to lead your going in and your going out, that Jesus as the good shepherd is also the door. Jesus said, I am the door, and he will lead you in and lead you out. After all, he's laid down his life for the sheep, and what you must do is learn to listen for the shepherd, the good shepherd's voice. I heard a man tell a story one time about going to Scotland and observing a shepherd. The shepherd would go out into the field behind his house, the beautiful rolling hills of Scotland, and he would call for the sheep. Now I'm not sure how you call for sheep. Do you say, here sheep, 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 come on sheep, sheep. Do you blow a horn? I don't know. Do you call them by name? But he called the sheep and the sheep came. Over time, as the shepherd told the story, he was training his son to call the sheep. And he would go out and call the sheep and he would say to his son, here's how to call the sheep. And his son was getting it, I guess. And one day the dad, the shepherd, said to the son... It's your turn to go call the sheep. And the son was so excited, he went out of the rolling hills of Scotland, out behind the house, and he called the sheep, however you call sheep. But the sheep didn't come. Not one sheep came. He found his dad and he went in and he said, Dad, the sheep didn't come. And the dad went out and called the sheep however you call sheep. And the sheep came one by one. And the shepherd called them by name. My sheep hear my voice. Three practical things that I leave with you today. One, know that God is a good shepherd. Know that God is a good shepherd. 
2. Take time this week to listen to the Good Shepherd's voice. You're on an airplane, you're at your house, you're on the MTR. You get to work early, maybe you go to bed late. Open the Word of God and listen to the Good Shepherd's voice. My sheep know my voice. And finally, this week, as you go in and out of doors, ask the Lord, the Good Shepherd, to lead you in and to lead you out by His grace. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we thank You that You said, I am the door and I am the Good Shepherd. God, help us Guide us, lead us in and out. And Lord, today, be a good shepherd to guide us to still waters and restore our souls. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.